floor is yours, Mr. Danielson. Thank you, Gary. First of all, I gotta correct you, right? There were fresh oysters here in Durango in the 1930s, and you'll hear it in my talk in a little bit. You're going to be wondering about that. You'll see. <laughs> well, I wanted them in 1881. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming tonight. And so welcome to the Lifelong Learning Series tonight on the restoration of DNRGW Reefer number 39 and including information on early railroad refrigeration systems, now grocery stores altered their produce and their meats in the 1920s through the late 1940s, and everything that was refrigerated at that time. There was a need for refrigerated produce here in the Durango area and all communities that were growing along on the railroad. For example, in the 1920s and 30s, Durango had approximately 10,000 residents. These 10,000 residents demanded something else other than just hardtack, sugar, corn, and flour. They demanded things like potatoes, fresh fruits, vegetables, fresh meat. It was the demand that pushed all of this along and helped the railroads grow with the communities. There was also another thing that happened at the same time that these communities started growing, not just along Durango, but along the United States. And that was the advent of the truck gardens in California and all the fruit and vegetables that were grown over in California on the farms. That just started in the early 1900s. And by 1920s, the railroads were carrying this fruit and vegetables on reefers through the major cities like Denver, Chicago, St. Louis. These all had reefer trains come in that were very fast. And then those reefer trains distributed on branch lines to towns like Durango. But it was only the demand from Mrs. Housewife in Durango that helped push this along. And to prove that point, you take a family of four in the 1920s or 30s. They needed starch. Starch came from what? Potatoes. Potatoes. A family of four, in my grocery experience, used about 10 pounds of potatoes a week. Well, take that times 10,000 people. That's a lot of potatoes to come into Durango. Now, did they come in with trucks over uh, Wolf Creek Pass in the 20s and 30s? It might have been possible in the summertime. Wintertime, forget it. And we needed potatoes here in the wintertime to sustain life. So again, I talk about demand. Demand was the major push of uh, causing these towns to grow. So without that demand, you would have still seen here hardtack, corn, sugar, and flour, and a town that might have been three to 4,000 people instead of what it is today. And before I get into the, the slides, I gotta give photo credits to these slides. And uh, the first one is George Niederauer, who isn't here tonight, myself, Joey Wigman here, and a man from Chicago named Matt Jamison. I think George is here, actually. Is George here? Ah, huh. there he's sitting way in the back. I didn't see him. Uh, uh, okay. Well, uh, I'm a member of uh, the Durango Railroad Historical Society, and the society's one objective is to restore an example of each type of a freight car that ran between Durango and Silverton back to their original operating condition for a historical display. So I got nominated to be the project reefer, project leader on these reefers. 
And when we talk about reefers, remember now, reefers are not marijuana cigarettes. <laughs> we're not talking about marijuana here tonight. This is about reefers. And reefers were short for refrigeration on the railroad. So the reefers was a slang word that was used on the railroad to describe their way they carried produce. And also this talk is being supplemented tonight by my experiences growing up in this little grocery store that my parents had from 1948 through about 1971 in this little town called Tower City, North Dakota. Well, my, as Gary mentioned, my grandfather was also a section foreman on the railroad for almost 30 years in this little town. And I went up to the depot, of course, and talked to the depot agent practically every day as a child. And I learned some Morse code at the time. So it was a fun experience between the grocery store and the depot. That's where I was all the time. Well, here we are looking for a reefer to restore. And everybody around here says, there's no reefers left. Well, I had found a man that supposedly had went down every county road in the St. Louis, or San Luis Valley around Monta Vista and recorded the location of every boxcar, reefer, and every piece of freight equipment that were in farmers' yards. I finally got his phone number and he agreed to meet my buddy and I and we went to see him and meet him and view all these reefers. So here's the first reefer that we saw. Now you got to remember that the railroad closed down in 1957. They brought all the reefers into Alamosa, tipped them over on their side, took every bit of steel or metal that they could scrap off the car, off the car, and sold them to farmers for $300 delivered on your farm site. Why did farmers want them? Storage. Well, the bunkers that were in the end of the reefer, and the bunkers were right at this point here. Those bunkers also the railroad took out so that the farmer had more storage. Well, as I said, we found seven of these reefers in the San Luis Valley. However, when we looked at them closely, you could not move these two feet and they would have just collapsed. The rot from the water and the moisture and the weather, uh, these cars were just falling apart, ready to be torched. Here's another reefer that we found. The best thing that could happen to this reefer is that if somebody touched a match to it. That's all that these reefers were, was just kindling wood. And we were getting pretty disappointed, to the point uh, that we were ready to go home. And the guy says, wait one more minute. He says, I'm going to take you to this place just outside of Monte Vista, that there's two more reefers. So he stopped the truck alongside uh, the sawmill outside of Monte Vista, and he says, there's two reefers sitting over there. And we looked, and we looked. We could not spot a reefer there at all. Well, it wasn't until he says, look closer. And as we looked closer, we saw that there was a concrete wall that faced the road. And over here was another concrete wall. And here was a metal roof over two reefers that had been shielded by a metal roof and set up on concrete blocks. We were in luck. These reefers were like they were stored in a cocoon for 50 years, since 1957. These cars were sitting there like this. Well, what did the sawmill need a reefer for? We found out later after what was in the reefers that these were used for wetbacks, sleeping headquarters. So that's what these reefers were used for with the sawmill. So we made a deal with the sawmill to buy the reefers. And then we made a deal uh, with the moving crane company to load them onto trucks and bring them over to Durango. So uh, here you see the straps and uh, the uh, 
way that we got the cars lifted up. And here you can see now the reefers loaded on flatbeds and ready to be brought over to Durango. The trucking companies and the crane companies really knew what they were doing. So now we're at Durango offloading to the two reefers. Uh, a sawmill company had given us temporary use of some very heavy duty metal sawhorses in which we were able to set the reefer down on. And here you can see the reefer now at whole sheet metal getting ready to be restored. Now you see both reefers being set down. And the thing about this slide is this shows the good condition of the cars that were facing the inside of this building. The sides that were on the outside, this other side over here, that side was pretty weathered. But we were able to restore it also. Well, the next phase was trying to get the underbody of the car back restored. And we found out by way of a rumor, and that gentleman is here tonight in the back row, Bob Shack Jr., thank you again, told us about there was a wreck in 1924 of one of these reefers over by Ames. And that wreck, he said, the bolsters, in other words, the end pieces where the wheels sat under. He says, that bolster is still there. We only had one bolster. And no, excuse me, we had zero bolsters. But anyway, he says, that bolster, he says, I think is still there. So we were able to hike up the mountain. And with a little luck, we found what was left of that reefer. They burned the reefer. There was nothing left of it up there. But here is the bolster that we found intact and the spacer blocks that went between the sills. Here you can see us on the side of this cliff, working through the mess, trying to find parts. And we got everything we needed in this bolster that weighed about 250 pounds. We dragged down the side of the mountain with a rope over the San Miguel River, and then up the other side, and we trucked it out. We then, we then had to make castings for these spacer bars that went in between this bolster. And we had to have another bolster made for the other end. This one bolster was intact. It was in good shape. It wasn't bent. Everything was all right with it. And the spacer bars, we had to have wooden cast forms made and then take to the foundry. And at the foundry, they made new spacer blocks for us. The next phase was making the wheel sets or what we call the trucks for the car. We had a gentleman in our club that is a real metal expert. And he was able to fabricate a whole new set of frames for the wheels. Notice these frames. The angles are all exactly the same. The spacing for the rods are all exactly the same. Nothing is crooked. It's all exactly straight. We found some springs for the car in our junk pile. We also found a set of journal boxes in our junk pile up in Silverton. So with all of these pieces, we were able to put together and make a whole new set of wheels, which again, we call trucks. And these wheel sets are unique in a sense that they even have inside hung brakes for the car. I'm not going to get into that. <clears throat> but anyway, that set of wheels looks like it came out of the factory, does it not? It is very nice. Now we talk about a reefer itself. Reefers were different than boxcars in a sense that they had double walls. Boxcar only had a single wall. And they had insulation in the walls. And then they had special roof hatches that allowed the ice to be poured down inside the bunkers. And finally, reefers had one other thing completely different than boxcars. They carried food. Food had to be kept 
Come on. Clean. Food could not be dirty whatsoever. So, reefers, and I can remember to going to Fargo as a child and going inside some of these reefers. You could eat off the floor inside a reefer. They were kept that clean. Because, again, produce would spy, spoil with contamination. There was never any animals such as dogs or cats allowed inside a reefer. Again, cleanliness was important with reefers. And the next thing that I'm going to show you is the underbody of the car. And to show you that, I'm going to pass along a model that I had made of this our reefer number 39. And remember, all the pieces of metal underneath we either had to find or make and install. There was none left whatsoever. Also, the roof on our car that I'm going to be talking about is completely new. So with that, I'm going to pass this around for you to just look at. Now we're going to talk about the refrigeration process in a reefer itself. How many of you have ever made ice cream as a child with a hand crank? Look at that. Almost the whole crowd has made ice cream. A reefer works the same way as an ice reefer as your ice cream maker. But it had some minor differences. First of all, what did you put down the side of the ice cream maker besides salt? Ice. Ra or besides ice, it was salt. <laughs> Rock salt. Rock salt caused the temperature of the ice to go down about 10 degrees. The Chinese discovered this in the, 19, in the 1400s. And they, were, they determined that you could bring the temperature of the ice down to 26 degrees. And that's exactly why your ice cream maker made ice cream, was that the temperature around the container was less than freezing that brought the ice cream down. Well, what happened when you stopped turning the crank? The cooling process stopped, did it not? Well, this same thing happened with reefers. Now, railroads could not always be on time. Sometimes there were derailments ahead of them. Sometimes they had a scheduling problem. So what happened when this car was sitting on a siding for 10 hours, a day and a half? All the ice melted, and the produce warmed up inside, and everything spoiled. So this is one of the downfalls of the reefers, was the fact that they couldn't control the movement of the car and the delivery of the produce on time. And these brochures show something unique about a reefer. In the upper right-hand corner, the upper right-hand corner of the train is going in this direction. The air is flowing over these ice hatches that are open. And the air is flowing down, and the ice and the salt are stored here on an elevated platform. The air is flowing here and here. This is all the merchandise in the car. And the air then flows again through this opening on the bottom, opening on the top, up and through that car. That is called ventilated refrigeration. That could bring the temperature of a reefer down to 26 degrees, good for fish and oysters. <laughs> so in Durango, in the 30s and 40s, they had lobster, they had salmon, they had crabs. They came in in special boxes in this type of refrigeration in reefers that were held crushed ice from Denver. And that came from the Pacific Northwest on high-speed reefer trains to Denver, then were offloaded to Durango. So yes, in the 30s and 40s, the town of Durango had refrigerated and chilled fresh fish. 
And I know that for a fact. I talked to some people, and they said this happened here. And the other refrigeration that happened on a reefer was they closed these hatches when they carried merchandise such as head lettuce, celery, radishes, tomatoes, any regular produce. And when they closed these hatches, the temperature inside a reefer was about 38 to 43 degrees. Perfect for vegetables, fruits, and things that didn't need sub-freezing temperatures. <clears throat> Some of the accessories that came on the reefers, the reefers also carried meat, sides of beef. For example, our reefer there has special wooden brackets on the side that held rods, that held hooks for sides of beef. This reefer, the ours there, could carry 16 sides of beef. That's a lot of beef to be brought in in one reefer. And sometimes there was many as two reefer loads worth of beef come into Durango every week. And where did they come? They came to a, a building in town on 7th Street in Maine called Swift's Meat Warehouse. And it faced the railroad. Not here anymore. The building, I guess, is still there. But it was where the meat was stored, and that was a big ammonia-based refrigeration plant that held all this beef. Here are the sills on our reefer. As I said, they were all in good condition. None of them had big cracks in them at all, except for a few minor bumps. These sills are still like they were made in, in the 1908. This is the, and the uh, bolster that we found on the side of the mountain with the spacer bars that we had to have made. And the center carried what's called a spider box. There was no spider box left on the side of the mountain, but we had blueprints to make one. So we had to take those blueprints to the foundry. The foundry made a form for us out of wood, and then we had to have them sand cast into this piece of metal. We had to have two of them made for our reefer. And this piece here, uh, the truck or the wheel set of the car went in. We were able to find this in our junk pile that we had in Silverton. Here you see it again. And the kingpin of the car that held the truck in place is now down through it. This is that spider box that I talked about that had to be totally cast new. So you can see now that in place in the center of the car. And the car that you're seeing there, you're seeing a couple of wood beams on the bottom of it. And that's called the needle beams underneath the car. Though it has to be put in place by way of oak beams under the car and a new block put in place. And these are called queen posts and truss rods, rods put in under the car. Truss rods were made specially in diameter and had to be special threaded on both ends, one left hand, one right hand. <clears throat> and they had to be bent at an exact angle to go up and through this bolster I talked about in the end of the car. So <clears throat> here's the car now ready for the wheel sets or the trucks to be put under the car. All the metal has now been put underneath the car. And you can see it again here sitting. And first one shows the coupler now is in place and ready to go. We found a set of couplers up in Silverton on a boxcar that we had. We had to drop these couplers and bring them down to Durango. And here we're working putting on air cylinder that went underneath. Air cylinder weighed 600 pounds total, and we had to lift it up into place with the transmission jack. Here's the coupler that's up in Silverton that we dropped out of the boxcar. And here it is set ready to go into the reefer. Here we're dragging it with a Jeep out of where it sat up in Silverton to be loaded onto a trailer to bring down to Durango. This is Matt Jamison, and he's getting the coupler ready to go into the pocket. And here's a gentleman that helped us 
and he's letting the boxcar down from uh, the coupler installation. The next phase was doing the roof of the car. The roof of the car, as I said, they use salt with this ice. Salt is a very corrosive material on metal and sheet metal. And the top of this roof was just like a honeycomb. It was just nothing left of it whatsoever. So whole sheet metal, I was able to take the whole roof off, put a whole new roof on for us, saving the center seams and the center uh, cushions for us, and put on all new flashings. So here you're seeing the roof now in place. Uh, it's been pre-painted once, but still has to have the screws all painted and finished. And here's the boxcar itself on the top of the roof, totally done. One unique part of a reefer is called a dog bone. This is a dog bone. And this dog bone was unique in that it had pins in here. And as you lifted the hatch open, it held the hatch open at a certain angle so that air could flow through it. And they knew that at a certain setting, they could take the temperature down to, say, 31 degrees by having those dog bones set at a certain amount. And this is a special lock that the reefers had so that they could ensure that nobody got into this the bunker between the place of origin in Denver and in Durango. And they had seals put on them so that nothing could happen to them. So this is the dog bones. There was none available for us to use or find any place. So we had to have new ones totally fabricated by one of our members. You can't tell these, this set of dog bones from the original. He did that good of a job making it up. Quite a feat of steel work. So you can hear, you can see the end of the ice hatches and the roof is not in place, the, the walkway is not in place. Now this is the uh, area where the plugs are for the hatches. And you can see where the ring went in here. And the ring to lift the hatch out, this is an old reefer over in Chama. We found a set of these rings over in Denver in a warehouse. So we now had a good set of plugs uh, to go in our reefer. This is that special lock that I talked about that allowed us, uh, allowed them to lock the reefer in place. The final phase of the reefer, it was the painting. Not the final phase, but almost the final phase. Here we're spraying the car with linseed oil. The car, was, again, was so oiled it sucked up linseed oil, just like water on a dog's back. It just sucked it up. <clears throat> this part of the wood is 109 years old. Now, there's a difference between a restoration and a historic restoration and just a restoration. George can tell us more about that with the state historical. But in a historic restoration, you must use all parts of the original car that you can, and if they're not available, then you can go with replacement. So, since there was a window cut out here, there was no wood available. We had to go with no wood here, new wood here. But this is all the old wood that's been sealed with linseed oil. So then we started painting the car. Well, a hundred year plus car sitting out in the weather, the first coat of paint, this is what happened. You didn't hardly even see that there was a yellow. This is the second coat. Still not very good. So when we talk about an historic restoration, one side of the car had a door that there was rot totally on the inside end of the car. Well, one of our members is an expert woodworker. He cut a plug, plug that was custom to fit to go in that spot and now the door is completely intact. 
And finally, the bunkers of the car were inside the car. And the bunkers sat inside where the ice patches are. And the bunkers, we had put in new bunkers. And here's the wall of the bunker wall with new tin put on there. The next phase was putting wood spacer blocks on the tin. And on top of the spacer blocks, heavy corrugated metal uh, sheet metal was put on top of those wooden spacer blocks. This allowed air to flow down from the open bunkers down in between the tin wall and the corrugation over the ice through the car and the cooling effect again that we talked about. And here I am installing some of the corrugation on the car. This is the other end of the car that had both bunker walls put on. So we left one end open so that people could walk into the bunker and see how the refrigeration process actually worked. The other end being fully restored. Finally, we had one member of the society that owned a sign company in, Durango, in, in Dallas. And he was able to come over and help us stencil the car. He was a, what's called a stippling expert, and knew how to stipple stencils. So this is what ended up with the car in the final position. Here you can see the car with the trucks and the wheels under it, fully painted, fully stencils. Notice how those stencils look. They look crisp and clean, just like they came out of the factory. That's the condition of our reefer. And finally, there's an end shot of the reefer. And here now, it's sitting up in Silverton. You know, you can take a, about 100 pictures of a subject and to come up with one good picture. This is what I call my one good picture of our river. You'd say that, oh, this was taken in 1939 or 40 with these old trucks here alongside the river. And now, this was taken last fall. This is my pride and joy, this picture here. Here's some early reefers that came out on the river that showed the advertising. This is a very short reefer. It shows the advertising. It says, fresh fruit and perishable goods delivered between Denver and all the way to Durango. Transportation of dressed beef, butter, eggs, and beer. So now we talk about grocery stores. Early grocery stores in the 1930s had very meager amounts of refrigeration. This picture was taken in the 1930s in Indianapolis. Uh, you will notice maybe, and I'm not sure of this, one case that carried refrigeration. And that was probably just ice. Everything else was displayed just out, non-refrigerated, with a tremendous amount of canned goods. We go back one decade to the 1920s. How much refrigeration do you see here? None. Everything was either in baskets, cartons. This could have been an ice uh, container here that contained something. But the rest of it was all canned goods. Notice you had to have five employees in this little grocery store to handle the traffic at that time. And so now we talk about Durango itself here and what happened on the grocery stores and how they ordered their merchandise here. Well, first of all, where McDonald's sit was the ice house in town. How many of you knew that? One person. So ice house carried huge blocks of ice. 350 to 400 pounds of ice were brought in from Lake Saloma in the wintertime by way of big sleds, and horses 
that came into town, they were, ice was offloaded and pushed into these ice houses and stored with sawdust in between them. So uh, inside these ice houses, there was a chart. And that chart said how many pounds of salt was necessary to be dumped in each end of a reefer to bring the temperature down, depending upon what the temperature was expected to be, say, 80 degrees the next day. At 80 degrees, maybe the chart called for 250 pounds of rock salt to be dumped down each end of the car. So it was all calculated out and figured out as to how much ice and rock salt was necessary for that car. <clears throat> well, finally, if we talk about grocery stores themselves. How did they order their merchandise back then? Well, there was a company in town here called Galavan Produce. They had a warehouse. I've never been able to find out where it was. But they had a warehouse in town here. And the manager of that warehouse went around to each grocery store, say on a Monday morning, and said to grocery store owner, how many cases of head lettuce do you need? How many cases of celery? And so on and so forth. He would go to every store, and there was about 10 mom and pop grocery stores in the 30s and early 40s in Durango here. And he would take this, everybody's order, and he would make up a master order. That master order then was taken down to the depot here in Durango and given to the telegrapher. The telegrapher sat there and typed this whole order to where? Denver. Denver had a huge produce warehouse. This master order then was put up by the warehouse in, Durant, in Denver, and they called the railroad to bring in a fully loaded iced reefer, or might have been multiple reefers, over to this warehouse. Well, this warehouse, when they got the reefer loaded, then called the railroad again for a switch engine to bring in those loaded iced reefers with, loaded with all the produce, over to the railroad yards. The train was then made up and immediately sent out on a line to two towns, either to Salida on the north end coming down or over to Alamosa through the Chama line. Well, what happened when the cars got to those two places? Now we had narrow gauge. So both the standard gauge car and the narrow gauge car were brought alongside each other, a platform put in between the cars, and big carts rolled with workers, rolled all the produce from the standard gauge over to the narrow gauge cars that were then re-iced at those two points. And those re-iced cars then were put in a train and came to Durango. Took about a day and a half to get from either Salida or Alamosa to Durango. At that point, when they got to Durango, the cars uh, was called for was Basin Dray Company. There's still, I think, the name around here. Basin Dray was called to deliver those produce, that produce, to grocery store X or grocery store Y. That was his job to deliver that produce. Was that the end of the line for the reefers? No. We had one more stop for a reefer. Where was that? Silverton. Silverton. Silverton had what? They had miners. And miners ate well and they drank well. And the miners and the mine owners knew that if a miner was well fed, he worked well. So it was very important to bring fresh meat produce up to Silverton. And what other thing did the miners want up in Silverton? Beer. Well, 
Beer was brought up to Silverton in the rivers also. In the wintertime, beer could not be frozen, so there were special heaters put in the ends of these rivers, and beer was brought up chilled, but not frozen, up to Silverton. And the railroads also carried one other product up to Silverton that's quite unique that could never be frozen. That was called dynamite. Dynamite could not be frozen. So with the heaters in the car, the railroads were able to transport dynamite up to Silverton 12 months a year. So that was quite unique. So now finally we're going to talk about how refrigeration worked in small town grocery stores, such as our grocery store. And well, I remember in about 1948 or so, we had one wall of the grocery store, and that wall had a lot of doors, glass doors. And behind the glass doors was a room. And that room was chilled by what we called an ammonia plant. Ammonia is still the best refrigerant that's ever been invented. Yes, Freon is more efficient than ammonia, but ammonia chills better, faster, and deeper. For example, big warehouses that need deep cold, 20 below, it's all ammonia that runs those plants. Well, our store, inside these glass doors, you could see shelves, and we had something maybe like a, head, a couple heads of lettuce there, a dozen eggs here, a steak there. Was it modern refrigeration? No, it wasn't modern at all. Best we could do back then, until 1956. 1956, my dad remodeled the store, and at that time we put in modern display cases, modern produce counters, modern dairy counters, and we kept the big towns from stealing our clients. So it was demand again by the consumer that caused all of this modernization. It wasn't the railroads pushing the customers to modernize. It was Mrs. Jones out there demanding more efficient ways for merchandise to be displayed and to be sold. <clears throat> Refrigeration process is a process that goes on 24 hours a day, all over. And I hope you've learned something tonight here about the railroads, refrigeration, and how grocery stores delivered and sold their meat products. Have you? Have you learned anything? Yes. Good. Uh, so, yes, sir, I will, I'm just one second. And I'll... Okay, you said the uh, ice came from Shalona Lake. Where did the uh, rock salt come from? Rock salt comes from any salt mine that they mined salt in big quantities. They had big machines that just crushed the big rock chunks into pea-sized rock. And that was very cheap. And that's another reason why the railroad used ice refrigeration, is it was a very cheap way to cool rock salt, probably a whole carload of rock salt. I have no idea what it cost, but it's probably pennies on the dollar. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Along with that, where, um, where did the, um, I guess Denver would have been the terminal that those uh, reefers started out, and they must have had an enormous amount of ice supply. Where did that, where did that come from? More an enormous amount of what? An ice supply for all of those reefer cars that, that went out on yes, the state. <laughs> did everybody hear that question? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, these big warehouses in Denver were all ammonia cooled. So and ammonia up. refrigeration, let's talk about that for a second. You either had to have an electric motor that turned a compressor that compressed the ammonia into a gas, and as the gas cooled through a condenser that was inside this big building, this warehouse that we talked about, as the gas cooled in this condenser, it formed a very low temperature. 
So that allowed big warehouses. Now, take that one step further as to small ammonia plants. Small ammonia was, do any of you remember, gas refrigerators? A few here. Well, gas refrigerators were run by a flame. Flame heated the ammonia, and as the ammonia cooled, it became chilled, and you had that same process going on. Again, as I said, ammonia was the most efficient refrigerant. Only the problems of methyl chloride, which is ammonia, uh, the fire danger, and the need for an electric motor, both of those things caused it not to be used on a railroad car. Next question. Yes, ma'am. The refrigerated produce obviously were carried at a premium. What were the relative costs of, say, what the railroad would charge for a refrigerated car versus one that was carrying lumber or gravel or something that didn't require the attention of the refrigerated car? I have not dealt into that, ma'am, but I'm sure it was more. I'm sure it was a premium that the grocer had to add on to the cost of the produce. Uh, so, I was going to say I lost it on that. But yes, it was a premium that had to be charged. Yes. Yes, ma'am. If it was the summer, yeah. and it was 80 degrees outside, uh -huh. and you're coming from Denver, how long could you keep the car at about 40 degrees Fahrenheit? Again, 40 degrees Fahrenheit meant that the refrigerator was in a, in a passive mode. In other words, it was sealed up completely. You could keep that car two days cold on the railroad before it started moving its temperature. And, uh, and uh, one thing I forgot to mention was, what was the most perishable produce that the railroads carried here into all these small communities? Anybody guess? Yes. What, Gary? I said peaches. He said peaches. You got it. You got it. Peaches. peaches. Why peaches? Well, peaches, any time you moved a peach or bruised it a little bit, a brown spot appeared on a peach. And as that brown spot grew, it molded. And as it molded, the peach was history. Now, we have a big peach growing area up in Colorado. Do you suppose those peaches came down here to Durango on reefers? Or do you suppose they were brought over Red Mountain and the passes by way of trucks in the 30s and 40s? Which one? It was reefers. For example, trucks going over in the summertime, going over these mountain passes. Do you think they weren't jiggled, the peaches weren't jiggled around a lot? Well, first of all, peaches in a crate they were lined with tissue paper. And here's a peach crate that came to our grocery store in the 1940s or 1950s. With the end of it, it's called a wagon wheel peach. And they, this, we liked Colorado peaches up in North Dakota. They were the best peaches. Peaches either were called cling or freestone. What's the difference? Do you, any of you know? Off the pit. Off the pit. Colorado peach was a freestone. In other words, when it was ripe, you could just open the peach and pull out the pit. Versus and California peaches were cling peaches. The only way that you could get them out was cut them out. Our little grocery store in the early 1950s. We sold between eight to nine hundred cases of peaches, about three to four hundred cases of cherries, a couple hundred cases of pears, and about a hundred cases of apricots every year. That's a lot of produce for a little town of 350 people. But we had a farm, big farming communities around there. And every once in a while we'd get a phone call from the warehouse in Fargo saying, we've had a reefer came in that got derailed or got spoiled or something, and the produce in it, we've got some peaches here that need a home right now. Well, my mother would get on the phone, and she would call every farmer that she knew, and my dad and I would get in the truck, and we'd go to Fargo, 
we get these peaches, we sold them for a dollar and a half a case. A case like that, peaches. Now today that'd probably be thirty, forty dollars. But peaches were the most popular produce in the summertime for a little town. Now the next thing we can talk about as far as produce real quick is potatoes. I think I said, did I not, that a farm family or a family in Durango consumed about 10 pounds of potatoes. Well, think about that, a town of Durango. How many potatoes was needed to feed Durango? You can multiply that out and it takes about two carloads of potatoes a week just to feed Durango. Those potatoes did not come over Wolf Creek Pass in the wintertime in trucks, I can guarantee you that. Somehow, the town of Durango survived and got potatoes. It had to be with reefers. Next question. Yes, sir. She'll give you the During the uh, homemade ice cream, there was a you know, brine, you know, the salt water, water bath that seemed to be important for the making the ice cream. So did they keep this in, was there a bath? Of, Salt and water? No, but what happened with this ice refrigeration process? As a, the salt melted the ice, that caused cooling, and that caused a brine. And the bottom of the car, there was a hole in each of the four corners of the car, and that brine dripped out the car onto the railroad tracks and went away. How long did the restoration take? Restoration took two and a half years and cost approximately $48,000. And restoration was only $1,300 over budget, which is not bad for that type of a restoration uh, that, uh, that took place. Uh, I'm curious, as the other gentleman uh, was asking, where did the ice come from, the, the cars coming from? Denver coming this way, you said the ammonia plant, but did they make ice in the ammonia plants? Yes, sir. So in they fact, in Durango, ice. Here, we had an ammonia plant that made ice here, and that was uh, where the post office is. If you look Kitty Corner, northwest across the street, there's a stone building, and that used, building used to be the ice factory, where the there was big tanks of water, and the ammonia ran through those. Chilled ammonia ran through those pipes, and the ammonia was about at minus 20. So overnight, they could make these huge cubes here in Durango. Yes? So at a certain point in history, they stopped harvesting ice from nature, especially like in Denver, they probably did the same thing. Yes. Before they had the ammonia plants, they That's would harvest correct. it in the mountain lakes yes. near Denver? Yeah. Okay. They all changed over at a certain point. Thank so you. If you. You know, I remember in the 40s, I was very young, <laughs> but you, you had ice boxes in your home, so people in Durango had an ice box, and they would probably go down. To the That's state. where the ice blocks came, was from the ammonia plant yeah. here in Durango. Yes. So you go down and get your block of ice, and you put it in the freezer. Yes, sir. Where is the car kept? Now yeah. it's up in Silverton, and we'll be ha having a display track that shows all of our restored equipment up in Durango now. It's on one of the tracks up there now. If you go up there now, you'll see it next to the uh, Silverton Northern Engine House. <clears throat> yes, sir? The Gallivan Produce is on West 32nd. Oh, it's still there? There, it's an electrical supply house. The building is The building is Huh, how about that? Yes, sir? Where did you have all this, uh, what floor did you take this stuff for the foundry work? The what? The foundry work for all of uh, it's a company out of Salt Lake City, okay. close to Salt Lake City, yes. Well, let's uh, thank Mr. Danielson again.